Welcome to the Evolution 2.0 podcast, where we explore the intersection of art, technology, business, biology, and spirituality. Here, you'll discover new trends in evolution that are changing the way we think about everything. This is your host, Perry Marshall, author of Evolution 2.0, 8020 Sales and Marketing, and guides to Ethernet, Google, and Facebook. I'm founder of the Evolution 2.0 Prize, a quest for the missing link between Earth science, the information age, and life itself. Let's join the conversation now. This is Perry Marshall, and I'm here with a very interesting guest, Joel Salatin. And Joel describes himself very proudly as a Christian libertarian environmentalist capitalist lunatic. And uh, you always got to like a guy who doesn't take himself so terribly seriously when, in fact, he's doing very, very serious work and dealing with very, very serious issues. But he just does it with humor. So I was introduced to Joel's work by my friend Nathan Auberg, who has been involved most of his career with various forms of nature conservation. And we were having a conversation about my Evolution 2.0 project, and I asked Nathan a question, something like, who are some people that are maybe outside of my normal sphere that would be simpatico with the way I see nature? And Joel, your name came up probably first. Anyway, I went home and I started uh, looking into your work, and I I absolutely love it. I think this conversation is going to go some very crazy, interesting directions, and so thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So you made an allusion in one of your blog posts about how the, the first five years of anything are usually a bitter struggle, and you... You went into farming and agriculture a long time ago and, you know, had your learning curve. And now, as people will soon understand from your stories, you have become quite the public figure related to doing agriculture and farming differently. So could you just give me a little backstory on how did you get into this work in the first place? Sure. Well, I was born into this family. My dad always wanted to be a farmer, and he never succeeded in being a full-time farmer, really. And his grandfather, my, I mean, his father, my grandfather, uh, also aspired to that, but he never did it. He he had a large, very, very large uh, backyard garden, and uh, but his income was, you know, he worked, he did the town thing, and um, uh, was a machinist and a tinkerer, and he was a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine. When Dad oh. was out of the, yeah, so my history of this kind of this environmental bent, I don't have a conversion story. I was I was born weird, you know, and so I had this <laughs> you know two generation legacy behind me of an environmental ethic that I guess was just in my DNA. So as I grew up here, I had this all these stories of well from Dad, his dad, he always wanted to be a farmer, never could. My dad, well, I always wanted to be a farmer, I just couldn't, you know, we just couldn't make it happen. And I loved everything about the farm. And so early on, I took an interest. I got chickens when I was 10 and started selling down at the little, at the little uh, curb market, which was a precursor to today's farmer's markets. And I set my sights for how do I get back to this farm full time? You know, Mom and Dad both worked off the farm to pay for it. We came in 1961 when I was just four. So I came into it as a teenager. It, you know, they finally ended up finished paying for it with off-farm income, but there was not a going concern. What do you do, you know? And so we realized, I mean, Dad was an accountant, and so he was a sharp pencil pusher, and he realized very quickly that a small farm can't compete in the commodity business. The margins are just too low, and you can't produce enough widgets. So you have to own the middleman. You have to be the processor, the distributor, the marketer. You have to own Mm. more of that... uh, you know, that value chain, custody. And so that's what we did, and we started direct marketing. And then when I finally, we, uh, Teresa and I got married, we lived in the attic of the farmhouse, and we were able to save up enough money in about three years to be able to survive for one year on the farm. 
And I said, okay, even if we don't make anything, we can survive for a year. I'm quitting my town job. So I walked out of there September 24, 1982, came back. Again, we were living in the attic. We were living on $300 a month. We drove a a $50 car. We never went out to eat. We wore, you know, thrift store clothes and uh, didn't have a television, still don't. But we, you know, we devoted ourselves to this, and it was tight year one, tight year two, tight year three. And, And by year four, we had a little cadre of loyal customers. We added the chickens. So we had beef, chickens, and eggs, and I, I was selling some firewood. I helped a guy plant trees. I helped a guy build some fence. You, know, you just kind of add in a few things. But the fact is, you know, when you're living on $300 a month and you do a, a project for somebody and get whatever, $800 in cash for your week or two of work, that goes a long way when you're living on $300 a month. So we eat through, by the end of year four into, in, into year five, we were able to exhale. <laughs> you know, we were able to, oh, uh, I think we're going to make it. And Dad passed away in our sixth year, but uh, he was very optimistic. And, and on his sick bed, you know, he said, he said, uh, you're going to be just fine. And, and, in fact, we have been very, very blessed time to be here. Okay. So in your Google Talk and a lot of your other speeches, you talk about how the giant industry that is the food industry has pushed as many people out as humanly possible. Now, you you would think that just the natural forces alone of the way of modern industrialization would be sufficient. But no, there's also all kinds of laws. And I don't think people have any idea how many things related to food are illegal. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't. Can you kind of give the uninitiated a sense of, you know, how controlled this thing has become? Yes, and let me just, I think the place to start here is just, let's say that you want to get raw milk, all right, that you've read some stuff and you say, you know, this pasteurization, this boiling all the enzymes away and stuff, you know, I want to try some raw milk. Well, there are some states that allow it. Uh, Virginia doesn't. And so in Virginia here, in order for you to buy a glass of raw milk, you have to purchase a portion of a milk cow from somebody. Uh, It's called a herd share. And so you have to sign a six-page document that enables you to invest in a piece of that herd, which entitles you to milk from the herd. It's not a sale. You're simply paying for somebody to milk your cow which entitles you to a, a portion of it. So that's how people do it. I mean, that's how we get. That's how I get my milk. And Teresa and I get our milk uh, here right now. But it's very cumbersome. What if we want to go away for a week? We don't want to get our milk. Well, legally, that farmer can't sell it, can't offer it to somebody who says, hey, I've got company this week. I'd like to get two gallons instead of one. No, can't do that. It's extremely cumbersome. You know, just I hope that that story illustrates just how into the minutia, into the weeds, the food police, have become. The, the same thing is true with almost anything, anything value added. You know, if I want to, let, let's say I've got a bunch of extra, whatever, chicken backs, and I want to make chicken stock, and uh, and a lady at church says, oh man, uh, will you make your chicken soup and bring it to a potluck? It is so good. Could you make some? I'd buy it from you. I'd buy it for, you know, 10 bucks a quart. Just our family loves it. You know, would you make some? Well, that's not legal for me to do unless I have an inspected kitchen, a HACCP plan, an inspected label, and all sorts of, of uh, things, you know, licenses. And so the result of all this is that the food regulations as currently handled, enforced, and written are, are extremely size prejudicial. They're fairly uh-huh. easy to jump through if you're big and you're running a lot of volume. They're very difficult and onerous and expensive to run through if you're very, very small. Here's an example. Let's say I want to do, I want to make homemade pepperoni. Okay, I, I got this recipe, and I'm a little bit of a little foodie gourmet geek, and uh, we're going to make pepperoni here. And so I make some pepperoni. But the problem is that in order to get a legal license, to sell pepperoni to my aunt or uncle, the regulation says I have to have a $2,000 
365 self-monitoring thermometer. It costs two thousand dollars. Well, if I'm if I'm a big company, you know, Smithfield or or some big food company making charcuterie, a two thousand dollar thermometer for a tractor trailer load of pepperoni is nothing. But if I'm a little cottage guy making it as a specialty little innovative product, two thousand dollars for my five gallon bucket full of pepperoni is enough to completely shut down the operation. And so this story, this kind of thing has been created for virtually all food commodities and and all value adding so that what it does is it limits market access to food choice. We live in a time of choice. You can choose your sex, you can choose you can choose all sorts of things, but if I want to go to a farmer and say, "Hey, you know, would you sell me some sausage from that hog there when you kill it in the backyard?" That's not a legal transaction. That's an illegal thing, and the government will put the farmer in jail. Now, what's interesting about that is that the farmer can give it away. You can give away the, your homemade sausage. You can give away your homemade chicken broth or chicken soup. You just can't mm-hmm. sell it. Interestingly, in the drug wars, uh, I don't want to get in a big argument about drug wars, but in the drug wars, they are considered to be hazardous substances, and the prohibitions are not just on seller, they're on buyer, they're on giving away. I mean, you can't even own it, all right? I mean, you can't have cocaine, you can't buy cocaine, you can't sell cocaine. I mean, you, you, it, the whole thing's because it's a, considered a hazardous substance. But in the food sphere, in the food sector, the prohibition is only on selling. You can buy it legally, you can eat it legally, you can give it to your kids legally, you can give it away, you can hoard it, inventory it, the only one who's prohibited is the producer for being able to sell it. Clearly, it's not really a hazardous substance. It's actually simply a mechanism to deny market access for innovative entrepreneur, uh, food, food craft folks. Well, my next question was going to be, well, you know, whenever I'm uh, I'm driving and, like, there's some – unusual sign about like a dangerous intersection or something usually it's like well there must have been a couple of horrific car accidents here so the you know like every sign probably has a story like right to play the devil's advocate one would assume that there's reasons why they don't want some little tiny guy selling pepperoni so you're a very fair-minded guy could you Give me a little context into what those situations are and why this is an overreach and what would be a better way of policing this kind of thing? Yes, and I am the first to say that this is not a conspiracy, absolutely not a conspiracy, and nobody is trying to shut out small operations. There's no conspiracy. Mm, now, okay. Among my tribe, I'm unusual that way. I'm unbelievably charitable that way. Many of my friends... Oh yeah, they just want to close us down, and they, uh, you know, and all, all this stuff. But I don't agree because I've talked to the regulators, I've talked to the food police. They actually do believe that if people like me were unleashed on them, if neighborhood, if neighborhood food craft were unleashed on its community, they really believe we could not build enough hospitals fast enough to handle all the sick people. Okay. Okay. They really okay. believe that. All right. So here's my response to that. Uh, uh, two things. Many of these regulations were developed, in fact, the whole Food and Safety Inspection Service was developed as a result of Upton Sinclair writing The Jungle in 1906 that exposed the horrific uh, conditions in Swift and Armour and you know, the big uh, packing plants of Chicago in that day. Remember, that was before refrigeration, before stainless steel, before indoor plumbing, before rural electrification, I mean, before understanding of food microbes. The fact is that today, for example, the herd that we get our raw milk from down the road, for 50 cents they use a test strip that 50 years ago would have required a $500 laboratory test. Today they can stick a little piece of paper in the milk tank after every milking for 50 cents 
and get the same data read on pathogen, uh, whatever, you know, uh, benchmarks as a $500 desk 50 years ago. So what happens is you have issues in a sector, fair issues, you know, swill dairies in the early, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, before refrigeration, dairies were, you know, were feeding distiller's grains from breweries because before refrigeration, you know, you had to put the breweries right near where the people live. So we had urban breweries, which made distiller's grains. Well, the other thing that went along with beer was milk. That was the other big fluid drink that required refrigeration. And without refrigeration, you put those as close as you could to the cities. And so we linked up these uh, swill dairies for eating the distiller's grain waste from the breweries. Well, it completely messed up the pH, the rumen of the dairy cows, and created, you know, underlet fever problems, tuberculosis, all sorts of milk-borne pathogens. In fact, the Mayo Clinic started at that time as a pasture-based raw milk alternative. People who were getting sick from drinking urban swill milk came to the Mayo Clinic and got healed from drinking raw grass milk like we've been drinking for, you know, 10,000 years. So there was this kind of aberrant industrial blip, if you will, as our own civilization, our own country went to a more industrial type of production setting without all of the related science, infrastructure, and understanding and knowledge that was required to make that leap uh, hygienic and sanitary. And so we have this lag time in metabolizing the scale, the increasing size and all that of the food sector. The food sector was expanding, centralizing, scaling up, industrializing ahead of refrigeration, electrification, microbial understanding, stainless steel, indoor plumbing, hot water, you know, all these things, that, including lab tests that made it possible to monitor what was going on in the system. And so the regulatory climate came as a result of people being scared of, of foodborne illnesses and pathogens and problems, and they, so they wanted government intervention on it, but then as the technology metabolized new techniques, then the regulations did not give space for people like us who have figured out how to use technology like refrigeration, stainless steel, ultra-hot water, things like that, to be able to offer uh, direct neighbor-to-neighbor commerce without all of the onerous paperwork and infrastructure overheads that are now required industrially and they're being applied even on a community-wide, neighbor-to-neighbor scale, and that's what's inappropriate. I'm not asking for anarchy or the elimination of government intervention. I'm just saying if you, as a consenting adult, want to exercise an option to engage in consensual commerce, I'm using very (laughs) strong words here, (laughs) to exercise your freedom of choice and participate in innovative diversity, you and I should be able to do business together without a bureaucrat being involved in that transaction. So then, really, our laws reflect 1906 technology. Yes, yes that is exactly correct, yes. And so, since laws tend to just stay there and stay there, right. and, and laws, laws also employ lots of people, yeah. Then here we are. Yeah, here we are. You know, I was talking to a federal inspector one day about this, and on our farm we actually process. We're legally allowed to process 20,000 chickens here on our farm without actual, we're actually having an inspector on site. We can't do 20,001, but we can do 20,000. So there are some interesting exemptions in the marketplace that give legal precedent for the kind of thing that I'm describing. For example, in Virginia, I can do elder care in my home and have three patient clients in my home without any licensing. The reason that exemption exists is because society recognizes 
that if I'm going to do it in my home with just three people, chances are there's a pretty close relationship with the families of those three patients. This is not a cartel. It's not an empire. It's not, <laughs> a, you know, it's not opaque, okay? There are certain protections at that scale. Uh, inherent protections in the type of relational transaction there will be. Another exemption, for example, right now in Virginia, I can keep three children in daycare in my home without a license. Again, mm. for the same reason. This is yeah. not a big, you know, industrial facility. Uh, I'm probably doing it with, you know, family and neighbors and friends. Da da da. Okay. And so, uh, right now, in poultry. There is an exemption, a federal exemption, for a producer grower to do 20,000 chickens per year on site, on the farm where they're grown, without government inspection. And to my knowledge, that exemption was carved out in 1967. To my knowledge, not a single person has had a, a sickness, a foodborne sickness or disease, from anyone in the country exercise, you know, utilizing that exemption. And so what it speaks to is that if you're only going to do 20,000 birds and you're not a Tyson, you're not a Purdue, you're not shipping them to Thailand, you're not, you know, and the other stipulation is that it can't be sold to a grocery store, it can only be sold to an end user. So, hmm. so there okay. can't be a middleman involved. So that there are stipulations. The point is, that this makes sense. It makes sense to carve out these kind of, in Virginia. Uh, four years ago, we got what we call the pickle bill here. A group of us got together and we lobbied, and we got an exemption carved out for for doing in your home without a license up to three thousand dollars worth of pickles a year. They're an extremely unhazardous food product, and nobody's ever been hurt from pickles, to our knowledge. <laughs> And it actually took, I think, three attempts, three years to get this. We finally got, they got tired of us coming down and said, okay, we'll give you the $3,000 uh, uh, pickle. And I appreciate your laughing. I mean, you've got to laugh to keep from crying over this. But the point is, what is it about the $3,000 and first dollar that suddenly makes them hazardous? You know, Good oh, question. You just went, you know, one dollar over. And the same thing with us. You know, what is it about the two twenty thousand and first chicken that suddenly makes it from a wonderful community thing to a hazardous uh, substance? But all I'm pointing out is that those kinds of numerical scale, financial, uh, you, you can cut it however you want to, but it is different when I come over to your house and say, could I buy a quiche? It is different than me going to Walmart and buying a quiche from Smuckers. It is different. And to say that it's not different, for the food laws to not recognize the difference is simply the most charitable thing to say it's unfair, and probably the most uncharitable thing is to say it's a conspiracy. But somewhere in there is the truth, and it's grossly unfair. And the bottom line is that this keeps people like you and I, because I buy stuff too, and it keeps people like you and I from being able to have the degree of food choice for our microbiome that we would like to have. It, when you walk into the supermarket and you see all that abundance, that is a very carefully vetted abundance, generally by scale because it's huge enough to pay for these massive overheads and infrastructure requirements that the food police require. You know, you don't see grandma's pot pie. You don't see Aunt Matilda's apple pie. You don't, why? Mm. Because Aunt Matilda and grandma can't, they're not at a scale that can pay the $100,000 to get the licenses, the HACCP plans, and the bureaucratic stamp of approval to be able to sell. If we would carve out, for example, I mean, I would simply like to see a blanket exemption that if you want to come to my farm, look around, smell around, and make a voluntary consenting adult choice to opt out of government-inspected material, you should have the freedom to do so. I mean, we say the government get out of my bedroom. How about government get out of my mouth? <laughs> well, one could easily imagine some app, you know, where you do your DocuSign, okay, I have 
consented to taking all risks <laughs> of drinking unpasteurized milk right. at Happy Fence Farms, yeah. right? Yes. We actually tried this in Virginia about 15 years ago when we were being harassed. Uh, our harassment, you know, runs a kind of a roller coaster cycle. They don't mess with us for a few years, and then suddenly they're back, and then they mess with us, and they're back. So one of these uh, times they were messing with us, I went to our minority leader in the House, in the, our General Assembly, and we crafted a waiver, a customer waiver, this, I recognize this is not, you know, approved by the government, blah, 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 but I take full responsibility, blah, blah, blah. He took it to the uh, Virginia Attorney General, and the Attorney General threw it out. He said, you can't waive or waive your rights. Wa-, he said, waivers just don't work and just threw, threw the whole thing out and just was wasted effort. So, you know, we didn't do that. But you are on to something. It, look, the fact is that if 15 years ago I came to you and I said, Perry, you know what? Guess what? In 15 years... There are going to be millions of people around the planet that jump into houses that are put together by people they've never met. They're not part of any, you know, Marriott, Sheraton, you know, Hilton, nobody. They're not even in the, they're not even in the hospitality business. And people are going to go into these houses. They're going to get keys to go into to people's personal houses, and they're mm-hmm. going to stay there. For <laughs> days, without any bureaucrat checking out the house to see if it's hazardous, does it have banisters on the stairs? Does it nothing? They're just going to go in there. I mean, how can we do this? And you know what? Beyond that, there are going to be millions of people around the planet jumping into cars with people that they they never looked at their driver's license. There's no little thing hanging in the light in the window that says, you know, vetted through the taxi cab corporation. I mean, complete strangers, complete strange cars, no bureaucrat involved whatsoever, and you're going to jump in with the, to the car. With, and you would be standing there with your mouth hanging up saying, no, 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 impossible. That can never be. But all what that did, it created a new word in our lexicon. The word is Uberization. It's the yes. uberization of the economy, and it's been created by the Internet's ability to recreate the instant feedback loop, the instant customer audit, if you will, of yesteryear's butcher, baker, and candlestick maker who were embedded in the village. They didn't need a bureaucrat to decide who the shyster was and who wasn't because everybody knew who the shyster was. You know, he lives down there on 3rd and 4th Street, you know, and he's always trying to rip somebody off. We know him. His name is John, you know, blah, blah, blah. Because the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker were embedded in a village, and everybody talks. And so as the economy industrialized through the late 1800s, early 1900s, as we industrialized, the economy became opaque. Our embedded butcher, baker, and candlestick maker now had razor wire fences. They were a hundred times bigger and employed a thousand people and had guard towers all around. And nobody knew who the butcher, baker, and candlestick maker were. They drove by and said, what are they doing in there? We better have a government, a government oversight bigger than those big opaque businesses. And we developed mm. this oversight regulatory bureaucracy that now is over everything and it is not being friendly in general. It is not being friendly to sectors to now these heavily regulated sectors of the economy that are desperate to break into an uberization opportunity but are being denied the ability to break into an uberization opportunity because the food sector and there are other sectors as well, but the food sector by far and large is, is the biggest one that is uh, has been regulated for the longest and therefore has the greatest amount of entrenched non-Uber um, you know, regulatory inertia behind it so that an Uberization of the food supply can't develop. You know what's funny is you only need one thing to get rid of the bad guys, and that's online reviews. Yes. Right? If, if your kids get sick from drinking milk, can you imagine the reviews? Absolutely, and you're exactly right. So what's happened? Let's think about this. Think about this, Barry. Whenever there's some big food recall, some big thing, I saw saw today where they've just uh, had a great big um, outbreak of sickness from romaine lettuce. 
anyway, whenever there's a food recall, what does the corporate CEO, whatever the brand name is that it's, you know where, where the problem was found, what's the first thing the CEO does? He calls a press conference, and the first thing he says is, we have complied with all regulations on food safety. That's the first uh. thing. And so what's happened is that the bureaucracy, the, I call it the U.S. duh stamp, the U.S. duh stamp has enabled corporate food systems to hide under the skirts of the bureaucracy mm. instead of being personally responsible for what they do. People like us, we're out here, we have our own brand, we have our customers, we direct market. We don't have a bunch of Philadelphia lawyers as available between us and the consumer. We don't have a bunch of, you know, uh, bureaucrats running around our processing facility, you know, uh, signing little papers and stamping little things. We're out here just completely in uber space on our own. And if we mess up, it's all the marbles. We're out of business. So because we have such important responsibility, we're extremely careful very careful about what we do, how we handle, those sorts of things. Uh, we're very careful about that. And that level of personal responsibility is simply not in the food system because it can always hide under the skirts of the bureaucracy. And if the right paperwork has been filed, all is well. Now, there's another side to this, too, which is the quality of the food that this big, giant system actually gives you. Now, I think there's a lot of people that go, well, you know, I buy organic things, and I shop at Whole Foods, and I go to a coffee shop that has Edison light bulbs and guys with goatees, and, and like, what's the problem here? So can you help me understand what are some of the intrinsic problems on the nutrition and ecological side that come along with all of this? Sure. Well, I wish I could say that the government-certified organic label is an answer to everything, but as most things government tend to go, they slide from their initial sincere, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so the same thing is true here. When the organic label standard was created and the National Organic Standards Board was created, lots of good intentions – but what's happened now is that the industry, as, as it's become a you know a multi-billion-dollar industry, the industry has taken it over, and so now there's a tremendous amount of compromise. So you would think that organic would not allow factory farming, you know, the concentrated animal feeding operations. You would think it would not allow um, vegetables that are not even grown in soil, hydroponic systems, soilless systems that don't have the nutrition in them. Uh, I mean, we're the only country in the world, only country in the world that certifies organic, you know, soilless vegetable production systems. So, interestingly, 20 years ago, for our side, I'll just call it ecological for sake of discussion, you know, Monsanto was the enemy. Oh, they were a great enemy. You know, they, it was easy to hate them, you know. I mean, just, you know, Monsanto was, a, you know, the enemy everybody loves. But now, now we've had to realize that our messaging and our conversation has to include industrial organics, as in industrial creep and compromise has come into the organic label, which is why there's now whatever, I don't know, 15 beyond organic type of uh, additional certifications, real organic, eco-verified. I mean, it seems like there's a new one every three months, some new certification effort because of the compromise in the organic label. So if we just leave organic off the table for a minute, what is the collateral damage of, a non-ecological production system, well, it's varied. We're all very aware of our loss of antibiotics and our creation of superbugs through sub-therapeutic use of antibiotics in livestock, including the creation of MRSA and C. diff, which are now you know huge superbug problems in hospitals. Most of us are aware of the pollution, the, the manure waste. I mean, if North Carolina... If North Carolina didn't get a hurricane every two years to flush all the manure, uh, swine manure lagoons out to sea, North Carolina right now be a toilet. So we see the, uh, uh, the dead zone the size of Rhode Island in the Gulf of Mexico is a direct result of chemical-based, mechanically-oriented uh, industrial agriculture. 
And so, wonderfully now, we know that a non-chemical, carbon-centric, uh, soil-building approach not only can feed the world, it can do it without all this collateral damage. And that is a very, very hopeful thing and, frankly, very exciting. I don't think that we have felt that as clearly as we do now, you know, for a very long time. And each day the ecological side is gaining credibility uh, scientifically and practically in, in this food space, in the sphere, it's gaining, partly because the infrastructure that allows us to do what we do, from electric fence to water pipe to manure tea, compost tea. Uh, I mean, I was in Australia lately doing a seminar with a company. They have an acre, an acre of earthworm uh, mounds, earthworm beds, with uh, collection pipes is very sophisticated, and what they're doing, they're collecting the lubricant, the mucus that comes off of earthworms. That gradually percolates down through the worm pile. They pull that off and make this amazing blended biological fertilizer that you use as a foliar spray. And, I mean, the testimonials from farmers I talked to, I talked to a bunch of them that were using it, is just you know, off the charts. We're seeing the same thing with biofertilizers. I mean, our side has not been sitting still, while the other side has been making genetically modified organisms and, and hydrogenated vegetable oil and DDT. Our side has been busy also, and the seemingly uh, higher production capacity of the chemical approach is now losing its credibility in the face of gaining credibility on the biological side, and that's very exciting. Can you give me an idea of the productivity that natural farming methods are achieving that people didn't previously think were possible? Sure. Probably the best one is really not considered an organic uh, thing at all. It's simply a management thing. It's called, for lack of a better term, rotational grazing or planned um, management-intensive grazing. At our farm, we simply call it mob stocking, herbivorous, solar conversion, lignified carbon sequestration, fertilization. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, the components that made this possible, literally since 19, basically since 1950, the components that made this possible were electric fencing, water pipe, and probably, you know, mobile shade would, would also be. So mobile shade, the whole nursery shade cloth, the whole being able to spin a polyethylene, you know, shade material, that's been very valuable as well. You mix those three things together, you have a portable tree, portable water, and portable control. And that enables us to actually move livestock around, I mean, poultry, sheep, pigs, cows, to mimic the migratory choreography of prehistoric planetary megafauna around the landscape. We know now that 500 years ago, for example, North America produced more food 500 years ago than it does today. Now, people didn't eat all Mm. that food. I mean, we had 2 million wolves eating 20 pounds of meat a day. We had 200 million beavers eating as many vegetables as all the people in North America today. It wasn't all people, but the abundance was spectacular. And the abundance was created by this extremely diversified animal choreography across the landscape, lots of different kinds of animals and uh, lots of different kinds of plants, a polyculture rather than a monoculture. And so we know what the productivity was today with the technology of electric fence, water pipe, and spun shade cloth, we can now mimic those kinds of things. So on our farm, for example, where the county average is one cow per four acres, let's just take a cow, it's a simple one, one cow per four acres, we're doing one cow per 0.9 acres, just a smidgen under an acre. So Mm. we're talking about... We're talking about four times the county average in production, and this is not because of fertilizer. It's not because of – it's simply because of managing 
to the bison, wolf, fire, pre-European migratory choreography of animal movement across the landscape. Well, Joel, this is what I think originally brought your name up in the first place. Nathan was saying that 500 years ago, you know, you'd have a herd of buffalo moving across the prairie, and they would be in a certain place for a certain period of time, but then they would move. And uh, I believe what he was saying was that if you artificially simulate that with fencing and things like that, then the grass has a chance to regenerate, and uh, it's actually like the cyclical nature of all that. You even mentioned fires and the intrinsic variety of having lots of species doing all their different things is actually an optimal environment as opposed to some guy with an MBA doing what he thinks is an optimal ecology. Is that accurate? Yes. Well, our modern agriculture system is predicated on several paradigms. One is that it can be highly segregated, not integrated. And uh, if you look at John Eichert, Professor Emeritus at uh, University of Missouri, uh, developed these four, he calls them the four pillars of industrialization. He says it's uh, specialization, simplification, mechanization, and routinization, okay? He said that if you want the four pillars of industrial economy, it's specialization, simplification, mechanization, and routinization. But when you look at biology, when you go away from mechanics and go to biology, which is what we're dealing with in agriculture primarily, and we look at biology and nature, we don't see specialization. What we see is diversification. You know, we want to see uh, way more different things occupying an acre, not just one thing. We don't see simplification. We see complexity. We don't see mechanization. We see, uh, instead of mechanization, what we see is biology or or life. And instead of routinization, we see spontaneity. In other words, nature responds to things. You know, if if you have a a bearing go out in the wheel of your car, it does not respond to your apologies for not lubricating it. It doesn't respond to rest periods. It doesn't respond. Whereas in nature, everything is responding, I mean, moment by moment. And so you have this spontaneity. The point that I'm trying to make is, yes, as John Eicher has pointed out, when we're dealing with life, with growing things, life is on a fundamentally different track than mechanization. And so the closer that we set up our agriculture systems to mimic these natural templates, the more they will function, you know, without disease, without those kinds of things, and they'll be extremely productive. You know, one of the themes of the Evolution 2.0 project is that there is a really 19th century uh, view of nature, which is very mechanistic, it's very Newtonian, and it's very survival of the fittest and everything is viewed as being red in tooth and claw and that kind of encapsulates the classical darwinian view of the world it's like the connotations of the word darwinian when you apply it to people and other things that's what i'm referring to right and Uh then there there is a post-darwinian evolution which is you know most textbooks and most pop culture is really about 25 years behind the science on this what I found is that all evolutionary developments are examples of higher and higher levels of cooperation. They are not just brutal, red and tooth and claw kinds of things. And, and what my filters hear when you are describing all of this is that you almost picture a 19th century British sweatshop with uh, 11-year-old kids turning screwdrivers or something, is this is the way that we think about agriculture. Yeah. Uh, it's like we're yeah. still stuck in 
59. Yeah, it's like something out of Dickens. Yeah. You're exactly right. Uh, you know, Elliot Coleman, the gardening guru, has this wonderful uh, metaphor he uses for this. He says, you know, it's like if you went into a gallery, a tapestry gallery, and the most significant one was a massive, you know, what, 20 foot by 20 foot uh, beautiful tapestry of a rural landscape. And it's got, you know, trees and rivers and cows and, you know, carrots and whatever, and people and children and sheep and all this. And it's, it's this beautiful, beautiful landscape. And you're standing there and you're admiring the beauty of this landscape, this very integrated, complex, spontaneous, dynamic ecosystem in front of you. And you gradually become aware of kind of a murmuring somewhere, you know, in the room. And you, oh, where's that all that murmuring coming from? And you finally walk around on the other side of the canvas and there is a group of you know 20 scientists looking at the back side of the tapestry trying to figure out the significance of this thread and that thread and all the uh, and <laughs> they're trying to analyze you mean like the canvas itself yeah instead of going around looking look at the beauty of this thing no they're trying to rip it apart from the back side they can't even begin to understand or parse or appreciate the beauty from the front side because they're so cotton picking busy trying to pick it apart from the back side. And I think that that's just a beautiful metaphor of where we are. I mean, we have become, look, in our culture, we have now learned how to give a hormone shot to a pig to sterilize it. And the same people who have created the hormone to sterilize the pig have never sat down and contemplated, I wonder what is the essence of pig. You know, what is the pigness of pig? What's the beauty of pig? No, we simply go to the backside and we try to manipulate it, pull out the threads, rip things apart, and we don't sit down to think about the essence of what we're working with. So, you know, on our farm, we have some pretty basic, simple, simple assumptions. And we, we drive these completely from nature. I'll just give you, say, four of them just so you see where I'm coming from. One is animals move. You know, we live in a time where animals move is antithetical to the entire industrial uh, farming system. Well, animals don't. Animals go in. They go in houses. They get crowded in little cages and pens. And animals don't need to move. You know, so animals move. That's just a basic thought. Okay, it's so simple, yeah. and yet and yet has such profound implications. Animals move. All right. Number two, nature has very few annuals. It's primarily devoted to perennials. There are animal, annuals, certainly, in nature, uh, but generally nature tends toward perennials. There are a lot of reasons for that. One is you have to denude something or kind of you know kill something that's there in order to get an annual up. So annuals in nature tend to be short-term opportunists. There are weeds and things that come in, in, you know, in a storm, in a flood, in a, in a devastation. And so the annuals come in as short-term healers until you get the perennials back. But there's another reason, and that is because an annual does not put energy in the soil. It puts energy up above in, in seeds. And it tends to put its energy above the soil. Perennials put its energy below the soil because... Mm. They're not depending on a big fat seed like a corn kernel or a barley kernel or something. They're not depending on, on a seed to keep them going. The perennial is depending on underneath the root web. It's depending on that, and so that's the bank account. And so the energy flow of an annual tends to be from the soil out. On a perennial, the energy flow is from the plant down into the soil. So we want to stimulate, we want to have a system that incentivizes and appreciates perennials. Number three, nature does not move carbon around. Fertility in nature, the Great Plains, the pampas of, of Argentina, the steppes of Mongolia, the deep soils on the planet are built from in situ carbon cycling. In other words, the plant grows, it dies, it decays, and the decaying organic matter in situ builds the soil. Now, the reason that the deep mm. soils on the planet are under prairies and not under forest is because prairies have a much faster metabolic capacity and a more efficient capacity for photosynthetic activity turning into carbohydrates and 
sequestering carbon. Now, they can't do it on their own. They need the herbivores, and the herbivores need the wolves and the coyotes and the prey to move them around. All right. So, so again, it, it's not in isolation. It's not in segregation. But the point that I'm making is that, that soil in nature, the deep soils of the planet, did not become created because somebody imported 10-10-10 mine fertilizer from the mm-hmm. other side of the globe and brought them to this spot. It develops with solar energy into biomass converted in situ to develop soil. The fourth uh, basic idea that I'll just say is that in nature, most things are consumed relatively close to their point of origin. Yes. So there's a fairly tight cycle of carbon, commerce, and energy of growth and extraction, and all that happens relatively close. Now, there certainly are migrations, that's for sure, but on a day-to-day basis, the poop that comes from the grass that was eaten on Serengeti, Serengeti spot A, the poop from that grass only falls a certain distance away from spot A. And so whether it's a bird that eats a seed and goes and poops or an herbivore that eats something and goes and poops or, for that matter, a tree that falls and decays, the point is that this whole production, decomposition, regeneration cycle occurs relatively closely. And so this pushes us toward a very transparent, localized food system as much as possible. Does that mean I don't eat bananas in Virginia? Not at all. No. But it does mean that I am cognizant and appreciative of the fact that every dollar that I invest in my local production helps to turn the dollar, the carbon, and the intellectual capacity to grow that and close that loop, it concentrates that intellectual and capacity within my locale. And that ultimately creates a more resilient, you know, secure type of functioning ecology. So, Joel, paint me a picture. Let's say that in the next 25 years, two things happen. One, we figure out some reasonable way to Uberize food, and we create a whole new cottage industry, just like we have a cottage industry of Airbnb people and things like that, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that happens. And the second thing that happens, let's say that 10% of the people in that cottage industry, they do the four things that you said, animals move, um, nature favors perennials, not annuals. We don't move carbon around, and we consume close to origin. What would that world look like? (laughs) Well, what that world would look like is you would have, who was it? uh, Was was it uh, George W. Bush, the shining points of light or something? Anyway. The thousand points of light, yes. The thousand points of light. What you would have, let me tell you, the most important thing that you would have, first of all, on your first one, the Uberization of food, the first thing that would happen is you would start seeing people able to buy much higher quality food from their neighbors at half the price that they spend today. Much of the high price of local food today and food craft today has nothing to do with production costs. It has to do with the scale prejudicial uh, hoops that, that small artisanal uh, uh, you know, folks have to jump through. And so if you take those away, suddenly you could really drop the price. So suddenly now people are able to buy much higher quality food close to home and afford it. Well, now you're going to see uh, sickness drop. Hospitals are going to be not as full. And I don't have a vendetta against hospitals, but I think all of us would agree that we would love to see our health care costs go down and people could buy – would it would incentivize people to buy higher quality food because it would be more available and it would be more affordable. And the 10% of the people who are really driving this would be successful. And we all know that in the innovation cycle, you know, 1% to 3% is a lunatic fringe. Uh, 5 mm. to 10% is the early adopters. 
and then yep. everybody else is 10 to 90. And so yep. to move a culture, you don't actually need 51%. You don't need a majority of the people. What you need is 10%. That moves mm. to a tipping point that everybody mm. else follows. The problem right now is that what I'm describing is still one and a half to two. It's still so – we're still in the lunatic fringe stage. And once we move it into the early adopter, move it toward 10%, then the debate is over. <laughs> you know, the debate is over. The food quality changes. People feel better. You know, communities thrive, and a lot of things happen. And so, absolutely, I think I think your 10% thing. I think a, it's doable. But I think the ramifications, the um, you know, the closer you come to 10%. The faster it goes, you know, when you look at look at like the way businesses evolve through time, uh, you know, and they start and they've got these, uh, you know, ten years of getting the prototype right, and then from the prototype to like a hundred times in duplication is it just five years, and then a hundred times to ten thousand times is just two years. You know, it's that escalating curve, and the same thing would happen here because suddenly people would say, "Well, I'm not afraid." I mean, I talk to people today that they literally think that there should be an inspection, a food inspection, for you to be able to eat your own carrot out of your own backyard, out of your own garden. About, if you survey, about 20% of the American population thinks that eating a carrot out of your own backyard is you're playing Russian roulette with your health. And what would happen as this became more you know, ubiquitous and disseminated, the, the infusion of dissemination of innovation throughout the culture, it would simply escalate beyond what we can imagine, I think. There's another problem that this solves too, Joel. I've made my living for the last 20 years in online marketing, and it's a great profession, and I love what I do. But one of the problems with it is that there's this tendency for 5% of the people to make 95% of the money, so it's the Amazon problem. It's it's where right. everything comes from Amazon, everything gets sold to Amazon, you know, and it drives all the little guys out of business, right? All the right. local retailers and stuff. Yes. What you're describing, if you Uberize food, mm-hmm. it creates tons of new businesses and jobs at a local level where some big giant corporation isn't competing with you because a big giant corporation can't do that. That's right. The main reason that we have such incredible centralization and the current, uh, what's the business, acquisitions, mergers and acquisitions going on as rapidly as they are in the food system is due to the economies of scale in complying with regulatory overheads. If you take the cost of compliance with regulatory overheads off the table, then suddenly I can sell at Walmart prices and make a great, great living. And that is an ultimately democratizing factor. And, yeah, uh, what you're describing is great. If I may, I'll tell you one example that I use here on our farm to explain exactly what you've just said. I call it the the real practical carbon economy. So we do a lot of composting. We and, and uh, we have a, a commercial chipper that we go out in the woods and diseased, diseased and crooked and junky trees. We cut up, we chip, and that provides a carbon base. And we make hundreds and hundreds of tons of compost from livestock, from chickens, from chicks, all sorts of things. We compost offal, the guts from chicken processing. So we have all this compost going on. The carbon source is driven by thinning and weeding in the forest, taking out trees that heretofore would have been killed with a fire, would have not withstood a fire. We're taking them out, shipping them. That provides our carbon base. All right, just imagine, and in 50 years, we've taken our farm from 1% organic matter in the soil to today over 8% organic matter in the soil, 1 to 8 and if we just moved, when we go from 1% to 2%, just move 1%, we create sponge capacity in the soil to hold an additional 20,000 gallons of water per acre. 
Well, we've gone from one to eight, so that's seven percentage points. Seven clicks times 20,000 is 140,000 gallons of water per acre that we can now hold today that we couldn't hold when our family came in 1961. I'm not bragging. I'm simply explaining the ecological, yeah. the healing, the evolutionary healing capacity of the soil when it's handled with carbon as opposed to chemical fertilizer. Now, so here's the end of the point. Imagine, just imagine, if we substituted all of the money currently spent on chemical fertilizer, all the money currently spent on fertilizer, if we substituted that with a true compost approach fertility program with a carbon economy, so all of this $5 billion that we're using fighting forest fires, we chip those dead and dying trees instead, and we use those as compost fertilizer to build our organic matter in our soils, we would not have the flooding that we have. We would not mm. have the drought that we have because we can hold more water. And here's the big, mm. the biggest mm. one is that we would create an entirely new industry of life-affirming, sacred, noble vocations for people who wanted to work outdoors and caress our ecological umbilical in this way Mm. so that they could come home proudly. There's 40% of our population does not want to sit in a Dilbert cubicle at the end of an expressway, punching numbers <laughs> in the cyberspace all day. 40% 40, 40 of people actually, they actually want to have calluses and splinters on their hands. They're the Michael Rowe, is it Michael Rowe? Yeah, Michael Rowe, the, you know, the, the dirty jobs folks, okay? Oh, yeah. And our culture right now, is marginalizing these people. We call them, we denigrate them. You're blue collar. We say, well, you're not smart enough to, you know, do anything else. You're a Sioux student, so you can go, you know, whatever, be a farmer or be a whatever. And so we have 40% of the sector of the population that has been summarily emotionally marginalized because they don't aspire to sit in front of a computer all day. The, all of those people... If we move to a carbon economy, we would move away from the petroleum. We would put that money straight into a carbon economy, create an entire sub-industry, growing our fertilizer through carbon, weeding our forests, eliminating fires, and building a soil that would feed mycorrhizae, azotobacter, earthworms. We would have much higher quality food, much more resilient fields, and an entire sector of people who could come home head held high proudly announcing to their children, Mommy and Daddy, you know what we do? We're building soil as a legacy for you to have a better world than we inherited. Now that is true societal evolution. And you haven't breathed a word about this, but wouldn't it also be true? That feeding eight or nine billion people would not be a problem either? That's correct. That's correct. There's, there's no question, but what I've just described is far, far more productive than an extractive, exploitive, mechanistic chemical system. There's no question about it. So, well, that whole narrative about how humans are a scourge on a planet, well, it is true if you teach the humans to think that the world is a 19th century Charles Dickens sweatshop. <laughs> yes. But that's not the world that God made. <laughs> no, that's right. And it's so important to realize that the human capacity for mechanics, you know, we have an opposing thumb. Monkeys don't yeah. have an opposing thumb. And our intellectual capacity, our, our brain capacity, those two things, our brains and our mechanical capacity, that gift can either be leveraged to rape the earth faster than anything could possibly do it, or mm -hmm. it can also be harnessed and leveraged to heal the earth faster than anything else imaginable. And the question lies in how we're going to leverage our mechanical and intellectual capacity. Amen, brother. Well, this has been fantastic. So two questions to close off. First, if we're going to pick one 
Joel Flatten book, one Joel Flatten video that somebody should go search for. What would be the book and what would be the video where they can learn more about you? Uh, the book would probably be, I'm going to give you an either or, because uh, one is broad cultural, and one if you really want to get what we've just talked about today and you want to get it in spades, the book is The Sheer Ecstasy of Being a Lunatic Farmer. Uh, <laughs> the Sheer Ecstasy. Great being, title. It is. You know, when people say, oh, come on, farming's farming. What's the diff? What's the diff? You know, farmers are farmers. That's the book that I wrote because I got so tired of being called a, you know, a bioterrorist, a typhoid Mary, you know, all these things. I said, man, you, know, you guys just don't get it. There's, there's ecstasy here in being the, you know, being the lunatic. I can either be upset about being a lunatic or I can embrace it and say, let's have fun with it. So the sheer ecstasy of being a lunatic farmer, that's one. Another one for, for a very broad cultural view is, folks, this ain't normal. Folks, this ain't mm. normal. And what it does, mm. it's a broad cultural view looking at our current modern America where everything from children children don't have chores to unpronounceable food to CAFOs to whatever and saying this is a blip in the course of human history. And if we want a regenerative future, we'd better look at the templates and the principles that have worked over centuries because what we're working with right now is a guinea pig blip in history. And that's not the horse to bet on. The horse to bet on is the one that's won 20, 20 races already, not one that's never won a race. So, folks, this ain't normal. Zealand. As far as a video is concerned, um, the one that was done by the Australian couple, uh, Polly Faces, it's simply a video about us, about the farm. That's the video. It's just and how do you spell Polly Faces? Yeah. P P O L Y F A C E S Polyfaces. It's um, our farm is Polyface Farm, the farm of many faces. Poly being you know many many faces. So we're we're many faces. That's the idea. Which is everything about landscapes to people to plants to even you know enterprises. Joel, this has been totally fun and very visionary. I I'm not sure I expected that we I would glimpse. Oh, well. This is the next inter industry that's going to emerge in 25 years because I don't really see any any way that it can't. I mean, it, it kind of makes me think of craft beer. I mean, the swill that used to be considered normal and acceptable, right. it, the world has moved beyond Budweiser. Yes, yes, very much so, very much so. And I think that, well, if, I don't know, if my instincts are at all correct, I think that's starting to happen in agriculture, too. And that, that's maybe the vibe that I got from your work is like, hey, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Like, we could have a whole other way of living. There, it's just like you said, there are a lot of people, they would love to run a farm if you could only make enough money doing it. Yeah, that's right. And so these principles, and we didn't, we didn't even get into how-to from, you know, low capitalization and all that. Uh, maybe we'll have to do another chat another time. But oh, That would be great. I'd be totally up for that. But if we did a theme of, okay, so I'm a beginning farmer, how do I get in? You know, that would be another whole, you know, whole chat. But, uh, yes, these principles definitely, they work on every scale. They work on small scale, large scale, local production, shipping production, you know, however you want to do it. They're very, very malleable. It's, it's the principle, not rigidity, it's spontaneity. Beautiful. Well, Joel, thanks for a great conversation. Thank you. Wonderful to be with you. Until next time, this is the Evolution 2.0 podcast, bridging science, technology, business, and the big questions. To ensure you never miss an episode, subscribe on iTunes or on your preferred player. If you like the show, rate us on iTunes. Join our email list and social media at CosmicFingerprints.com. Evolution 2.0.